16 network, one code to rule them all. Oh, wow, okay. Oh. That's not at all. But that's okay, well, never mind. <laughs> See you next year. That was beautiful. I still appreciate you, though. Is this not the best conference ever? Huh? Can we just, can we just not feel ourselves for just a minute? I feel good. Thank you very much. My name is Scott. You can go out and Google with Bing for Scott. <laughs> if, uh, if you do that, if you do that, you're gonna, it's seriously like actually go Google with Google for Scott. You'll find Scott brand toilet paper and then me. <laughs> so when you all are now code newbies and learning to code, I want you to write a little article about code newbies and how great it was at Codeland. And then you're going to say, and that one dude, Scott, A H R F equals Hanselman.com, and then help me get that juice to get above Scott toilet paper, because we can't allow that to happen. All right. So uh, my name's Scott, and I've got a podcast that is fantastic, and I had all kinds of famous people on the show before in the past. Yeah. Woo! People catching, catching people on the come up, but it's all good. Um, the show, and I have some pretty intense imposter syndrome. I've been trying to deal with this for a long time, but I will tell you that after 11 years and 575 episodes of this podcast, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> and I would encourage you to check it out. It is pretty cool. If you like NPR, it's like fresh air for developers. I got another show called This Developer's Life. It's unlike anything you've ever heard before. Not in any way a ripoff of This American Life. I have. <laughs> have to say that for legal reasons, but I just want to give you a heads up. But I do them because they make me happy. Now, uh, uh, the MC said I do work for Microsoft. I apologize. Um, but I actually work out of Portland, Oregon, which is on the forest moon, uh, safely outside of tractor beam range. Uh, and I work in open source, which makes it even better. Basically, we're just a bunch of stormtroopers running around. Darth Vader's gone. We don't know what any of these buttons do. So if, if, we tend, if we happen to destroy your startup, Microsoft is not nearly as organized as it would need to be to be as evil as you think it is. <laughs> so don't worry. It was like an oops, Alderaan kind of situation. Uh, now, when I went to work at Microsoft, I was coming from open source. I'm actually a long time open source person. I went to Microsoft to open source.net, which is what I work on, C Sharp and .net, with Maria from my team, who's over there. Hello. And um, when I went to work at Microsoft, people said I was a sellout. And it hurt my feelings. It hurt my feelings a lot. I didn't know how to deal with that. Because when you say you're a sellout, how am I going to deal with that emotionally? How am I going to find it inside myself to work through those kind of issues, right? But somehow I found a way to feel OK about myself. Because before I worked at Microsoft, you know, that's me right there. Um, you may have seen me in Gulliver's Travels and on Girls for a while. Um, before Microsoft was rough. It was a tough time. But after Microsoft, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> now, we won't get into the details of Microsoft and how it works. But here's a picture of our org chart for you just to get a sense <laughs> of what it's like to work for Microsoft. It's a little intense. But what we're going to talk about today is uh, a juxtaposition between the cloud and the browser. And it all came from a conversation that I had with a woman at Intel who saw one of my talks on becoming a web developer. And she came up afterwards and says, I want to become a web developer. The thing was, though, she was elderly. And when I say elderly, we're talking 100, 105, 120. <laughs> she was one of the early Intel, like, you know, low digit employee type people. Okay? So she was like micro code 386 internal assembly language type stuff. Um, I don't have any pictures of her. I do have a picture of my dad taking a selfie. Just to give you, <laughs> give you just a sense, a sense of the kind of generational gap that exists uh, between the different people. This is a kind of like an old coder type. It's just like, you know, I didn't hear you. I was too busy inventing the compiler. Um, and she said, I want to learn how to be a web developer. And it got me thinking, what would that be like to teach somebody to be a web developer if they were already 45 years into software but skipped out on all the AOL and all the nested tables and all the, yeah, we're nested tables. And you know, all the, you know, just all the sins that we committed over the, you know, GeoCities, all that good times. So we talk about the cloud and the browser. So I said, okay, cool, I'll talk to you about that and explain the difference between the cloud and the browser. Um, so I figured I'd like go with quotes 
but I heard here at, uh, at Codeland that we just make up quotes. I can't prove that this is a quote. It's from Thomas J. Watson. I think he worked for IBM. I couldn't find a picture, but I do have this really old book. <laughs> so I'm just going to say that was the dude. So, <laughs> this old man here said, uh, I think that there's a world market for five computers. Now, we've learned about mainframes today. We heard about what mainframes do. These are these big refrigerator-sized computers. This guy here at IBM thought that there would be five computers. There'd be like the Brazil computer, right? And there'd be like the North American computer. And they would be these big things that you would then send a job to, a batch of work. And we'd sell five of them, and the world would be covered in computers. That actually happened, though, didn't it? I'm not talking about the pocket supercomputers that we have, that we use to you know, troll people and look at uh, cat pictures on the internet. <laughs> I'm talking about the clouds. They're big refrigerator-sized computers. They just happen to be a little bigger than we thought they would be. They're filling up football fields. There's like the Google computer and the Azure computer. And I guess there's a bookstore that has a computer that I don't <laughs> It's kind of nice. And I think they're doing all right. Um, now, here's a picture of Azure. I know that uh, we're a little behind, uh, but we're getting color. This is going to be great. And we are, we are adding to Azure all the time. We're always putting in new, new Azure, you know, and, and Steve, I mean, no, not Steve. I mean, Satya thinks that's really cool. So when we talked about the cloud, I had to explain to this engineer from Intel what the cloud is about. And I said, well, let's, let's do this. Let, let's go back to first principles. And I'm feeling a little intimidated, right? Because uh, you know I'm 45 and she's got 45 years experience. But you know I won't let that stop me. So I said, well, let's look at this. Look at this diagram here of the characteristics of an operating system. These are the things that one has to have in order to call something an operating system. And she says, oh, I invented that. <laughs> so like any mediocre white male, I persisted. <laughs> and I said, well, actually. <laughs> no, for real though, I said like, okay, so you got that then. <laughs> you want to do a refresher or are we good? <laughs> so these are the characteristics of an operating system, but the magic isn't that you, know, you have storage and you have APIs and they talk to an operating system which then talks to hardware. The magic started when we virtualized that hardware. When you could pick up a computer and lie to it, and put it on a thumb drive and hand it to your friend, and the computer doesn't know that it's in the matrix. <laughs> the computer doesn't know it's portable because you've virtualized or hidden the hardware from you, and that's really amazing. If you, there's been there's movies about this. You've seen The Matrix, right? That was all about Neo. He's trapped in VMware and he couldn't get out. <laughs> you all saw Inception. Inception was a movie about how if you run a virtual machine inside another virtual machine, <laughs> time slows down. <laughs> right? There's computers everywhere, right? And now you can go up to like websites, like you can go up to like VM Depot, which is like a, a library of virtual machines, and say, I want that Jenkins machine. How do I get Jenkins on Ubuntu? Here's the instructions that I can type, and I say Azure VM create or whatever, whatever, and I hit enter, and I programmatically make a computer programmatically making a computer. I write some code and a computer appears somewhere on the other side of this wall in my infinite data center that you can't see. In the old days, my boss would call an API. And by call an API, I mean he would fax me a memo and say, I need you to scale the web farm. And then I would go down to PC Micro Center and get some computers. And he would go, wow, the cloud is amazing, not realizing I worked all weekend long to be the cloud. Right? But now you can go out to the command line, you type Azure, you type Google, you type AWS. If you type Azure, you get like some um, ASCII art at the top there, which means that Microsoft is not evil anymore. And then you start making virtual machines. The thing is, though, when you make a virtual machine for an application that you're going to make, you're responsible for it, like a puppy. Right? Hey, free puppy. Now I got to water it, and I mean, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't have a dog anymore, um, but you know you got to you got to keep it alive. You know, suddenly my expense reporting application or my New York Library application now needs me to go and SSH into it or shush into the machine. Uh, Y'all do that? Is that is that only me that shushes into computer? I'm trying to make that a thing. If you would back me up, anytime at work next time you're like, yeah, I need to shush into production. 
Do it with a straight face, though, and see if anyone notices, because they will start saying, oh, wow, she was shushing all over the computer. It'll become a thing, and then we can go look back, and this will be the day that we made it, because right? it's faster than SSH and in whatever. Anyway, so you make a virtual machine, and then I want to have a, an expense reporting application, but I'm responsible for running apt-get update and apt-get upgrade, and I don't know which one to run in what order, so I just run those over and over until it shuts up, right? You just do whatever you can to shut it up. You realize, though, a virtual machine gives you power, but you manage it and you're responsible for it. It's like your first house. My sister-in-law just bought a house. And she's like, yeah, we bought a house. We're, we're here. We made it. And I was like, yes, <laughs> how's the roof? How's the roof looking? How are the gutters? Did you get the cable hooked up? Oh, you're not set up for cable. Are we knocking a wall down? Or are you just going to have the cable on the ground? Those are the kind of issues. But she, I just want a house. I just want to run my expense reporting application. I don't want to own a virtual machine. That's not my place. Well, I could get a rental. But what I really want is like a hotel where I can go and thrash the hotel afterwards. I want not infrastructure as a service. That's a virtual machine. I want a platform as a service. I want a place to stay that I can thrash and then go back like the hotel that I just thrashed because I'm a rock star <laughs> and I have completely destroyed the Marriott and that's fine because it's platform as a service. They're going to reset it. I don't know. They're going to reboot the room. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> I know they're going to move my stuff around in a creepy way, and my toothbrush is going to be suddenly like not where I left it. It's going to be standing in a jar. That's OK. But it's like, that's amazing, because it's not a house. So you make these virtual machines, or you make these web applications, now you want to scale them. I spent the 90s learning how to scale. We heard about this earlier in a talk, where we talk about what a, what a web server is, and how web servers scale, and web farms, things like that. Literally, on my multi-page resume, because I'm old, I get one of those. Page two is how to make a web farm. That is the 90s, dedicated to learning web farms. But y'all, and by y'all, from a computer science perspective, that would be the set of all people who are not me, <laughs> y'all just get to pull a slider bar. Think about how that makes me feel. <laughs> the 90s is a slider bar. <laughs> and then I showed this to someone at work, and they're like, well, it's also a checkbox. Like, that, is, that, that does not help me. That does not let me feel better. And then they showed me this new thing from a guy, uh, Guillermo Roche, who has a thing called Now, where you can just make a folder and type Now, and it'll make a web server in the cloud. That's hurtful. <laughs> That's hurtful. If you go in like Azure and you say Azure site scale, this line right here, updating a server farm, that is 10 years of my life. I had to rip out page two. My resume just goes from one to three. And I'm not even going to renumber it, because I just want people to feel my pain <laughs> and understand how that's not OK. And then the young people in my office are like, oh, this web farm is taking like a minute. Blah, my latte. <laughs> right? But I'm not bitter at all, OK? I just want to tell you, I appreciate that. What's exciting, though, about the slider bar isn't that I'm an old man who shakes my fist at the cloud, but rather that this magic slider bar is sitting on the shoulders of giants. Just as I am sitting on the shoulder of the giant Intel employee who made microprocessors and microcode, and I'm talking about how, oh, I use Node.js. I'm on the metal. You are not on the metal. You are about 15 <laughs> levels above the metal. The metal is registers and CPUs, but things we don't worry about anymore. Isn't that amazing that then the young people and the new developers get to pull the slider bar, and something happens, and they go, what just happened? <laughs> and then I get to say, magic. <laughs> and here's what's so great about being old, is that half of us in the room are like, that was a Doug Henning GIF. And the other half is like, that's a Shia LaBeouf GIF. And two of us, two of us are thinking, how did he find Shia LaBeouf dressed as Doug Henning? while the rest of y'all are frantically Googling either Shia LaBeouf or Doug Henning to figure out what this joke is about. Where's my Doug Henning, Shia LaBeouf combo people who are on the, right there, he knows what's up, old people. So you're gonna go into the cloud, the cloud doesn't care about language choice. My friend at Intel says, well, what kind of, what kind of uh, internet language should I use? Should I use C++, should I use C Sharp, should I use Java? Use whatever makes you happy. I said, you can use whatever. You can use Java, you can use PHP, you can use anything that makes you happy. She couldn't believe it. 
And I said, it's all, it's all open source. It's all open source. I said, we're at a different level of abstraction right now. We're floating above the, all the work that our grandfathers and grandmothers did in the past. Now, some people don't realize that the cloud provides that new layer of abstraction, and they don't understand it. Now, I was at a conference uh, somewhere. I don't remember where it was. And uh, the chief architect at the time of Netflix was there. It's a British guy. He looked like John Malkovich. And, uh, and he was amazing because he was British. Because I like, I'm really impressed easily by British people. <laughs> and he was like, "Hello," and I was like, "Oh, plus two charisma." <laughs> Just like he, oh, I love this guy. Why? Ooh, English. Must know what he's talking about. Must be smarter than me. And he came out and he's talking about how he was scaling Netflix. And one of the fundamental architectural decisions he made was they were moving from regular hard drives, you know, spinning rust, like the ones you can hear. Right? If I can hear your hard drive, I can't trust you. We can't be friends. Or, or an SSD, a solid state disk. That's a memory disk. Those are the ones you can't hear that are super fast. And the question for him was, how much faster and how much money? And they measure this thing in the cloud. They call it IOPS, in input operations per second. It's just a number that says you get 300 IOPS on this small. And if you want a medium, then you get 500 IOPS. Or if you want a large, you get 1,000 IOPS. And it'll get faster. You give us more money and we will make it faster. So he finds out that it's like a dollar for 300 IOPS, or it's $3 for like 10,000. And he's like, Psh, OK, three times more money, eight times faster, cool. And he goes and he gives a speech, and it's amazing. And he like talks about how he's making those decisions at a chief architect type level. And then this guy comes up. I think I was in Denmark, a little Danish dude. I don't know how to do a Danish accent, but I know how to do a uh, dork. <laughs> And he's like, well, you know, actually, sir, like the SSDs are, in fact, you know, the mean time before failure of the software. And he basically said SSDs fail a lot because apparently his laptop crashed playing StarCraft yesterday or whatever. <laughs> and, and he was asking the chief architect of Netflix, like, why would you make such a dumb error as to convert Netflix to SSDs? Because they clearly fail. How are you going to do that? How are you going to deal with that? And the British dude, like, took it. He just, like, stood there. Because the British, that's what they do, right? And then they leave. But that's cool. Um, <laughs> And he says, that's not my problem. I'm renting them. Oh, if the hard drives fail, whose fault is it? Amazon's, the cloud. He doesn't care. Hey, I crashed my rental car. Did you get full coverage? Better come pick me up. I'm going to break this one, too. I may drive it into my hotel room, right, just to, just to make a point. My stuff's in the cloud. I don't care. Don't mess with anybody who doesn't have anything to lose. If I've got it in Dropbox, you watch me. Um, <laughs> this kid, though, didn't know. He didn't know he'd been cut. Someone needed to tell him. He just stood there. It was like those ninja movies where somebody goes like, Shoop. and then like the brain has been cut, and then the, this part of the brain falls down and slides, and then the body, though, is like, Do I shove him over? Do we push him to the side? What do we do? I don't have a picture of that. I did not make an animated GIF of that moment. It would be too bloody, and there's young people here. But I do have this. That's, that's kind of a reenactment. That's effectively what happened. One of the greatest scenes in movie history. The chief architect of Netflix and cloud people think at a higher level of abstraction. We talk about abstractions and leaky abstractions. If I don't care about the hard drives failing because I'm renting them, then I can not care about a bunch of stuff. Then I can really feel fancy because I have a startup, so I'm just going to go to Costco and get the cheapest TV I can. I'm going to put a dashboard up with a map of the world. Because you know, you know I have a startup, actually? I have a little startup. Um, and I, uh, we have offices all over the, the world. Um, I, I usually hang out at Panera, and they have offices. <laughs> You know, all over. And I, I registered recently a domain, uh, which makes me a founder, which is, which is cool. Uh, so then I just set up like a dashboard on my TV with the picture of the world, right, with all my Amazon. So, you know, I'm cool. This is a dashboard, an Azure dashboard, that's actually going to show me how much money it spent. It cost me $37 last month. How many requests? I had 500 people visit my site. Um, and then sessions, browser. This is that dashboard that lets you see the big picture. This isn't a dashboard like one of these kind of Poser dashboards, right? This isn't an old person dashboard. Old people just, they love to run top and say, I have a dashboard. 
finally got an old guy at work to upgrade his dashboard. He's like, all right, fine. H-top. H-top, it's got color. It's better, right? It's not better. He's wrong. He is demonstrably wrong. You can't come to me and call that a dashboard. People need to stop trying to, I did, if, don't come for me if I didn't send for you. Don't tell me, don't tell me that Mario is a superior Luigi. Uh, Luigi is the better Mario brother. You can't, you're gonna tell me that it's always been Luigi. Please. Woo! Excuse me, I just get a little upset. People try to tell me when something's better when it's not better. All right. Now we move to the browser. We move to the browser and we start talking about that. Remember this? Yes, she invented it. This is the characteristics of an operating system. Now back in the day, you would sit down at a computer that looked like this. And you would talk to a refrigerator that looked like that. And then you would log into a program. And the program would look like, like that. And then that program would appear on the computer screen, right? But who did the work? Who did the work? Was the work happening here? No, the work happened on the fridge. This was a dumb terminal just waiting around, sitting around. And then what happened? The internet happened, right? Tim Berners-Lee went and made, this is the first page of the internet. It actually is at the same URL, the same location. The first page of the internet on the first server of the internet actually had a sign on it that said, don't turn this off, it's the internet, <laughs> with, with a piece of tape. It's actually still up there. Now when he made this, he thought that it would be like an infinite book. It would be like pages that you could, could just go through. He didn't make an application platform. He didn't envision the Khan Academies and the New York Public Libraries of the world to do that. He was just kind of being humble and being cool. Now, I appreciate that a lot of us are code newbies. Some of us are looking for that senior engineer title. I just want to point out that Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the internet, did not put the <laughs> in front of his name. He could have put the, and it would have made a statement. It would have made a statement, and it would have shut it down for everybody else who wants to put. He, he, didn't, he didn't put senior. He didn't put the. He didn't, so I can't say. Anything, I just put dev, just to be safe, because I don't want to try to perpetrate that I'm something that I'm not, because he didn't know what he was doing when he made the internet. He could never have imagined, he couldn't have conceived that not only did HTML and the World Wide Web turn into what it was, but also that things like PDF would be created because HTML can't do stuff, right? Remember we made PDF so we could have books look the way we want. And he never thought that PDF would become the fifth most popular religion on the planet. <laughs> How could he know? <laughs> These things just happen. But I am non-denominational. I support you in all religions. Everyone should be able to convert to PDF no matter where they live. <laughs> Will not live under a cloud of oppression as I try to convert to PDF. So then what happened? What happened? I was browsing the web one day and then Java loaded. We all remember when that happened, right? Because Java popped up and it said, are you sure you want to run Java? <laughs> Scan your driver's license and type in, I'm sure. And then these guys came out, we can do it too, Whee! And then they're like, we've got YouTube, we have a reason to live. Why did we do that? We did it for a reason though. We did it because we wanted a little computer inside the browser that would let us talk to it and do stuff that we couldn't do before. So people would start to do stuff with it to make an application platform, to make apps that weren't just HTML. And that's good and that's bad though. I, uh, I've got a Prius, because I'm from Portland, they give it to us when we're, on, when we're born. <laughs> hey, it's a baby boy, smack him on the butt, here's a Prius. And uh, I go to the, the Toyota dealership, and uh, as with all code newbies and engineers, when you see someone on a computer, getting you on the airplane, getting your car ready. You're like, what kind, of, uh, what kind of system you get there? And then the next thing you know, you're sitting next to them learning how to upgrade yourself to first class because you want to see what kind of system they're running. You want to know the hotkeys. You want to know what's up. They know that about me at Toyota. So Toyota says, oh man, we got a new system. Come check it out. It's going to be fantastic. The old system used to have a dumb terminal that would talk to a mainframe. The new system, he said, was amazing. He pulls out shiny new Dell, flat screen monitor, loads up Windows XP. 
like, I, you know, I, do I say something? I'm just like, no, fine. So he loads up Windows XP, he loads up Firefox, he opens a Java jar file from the desktop, which opens a terminal emulator that goes back to the same mainframe. And then looks me in the eye and tells me, this is way better than before. <laughs> Why? What's on the internet? We gotta stop doing that. We gotta stop trying to make these systems where it's a little bit of functionality here and a document over here. It's not healthy. It's only good for physics examples. And while Java is a great language to learn on the server side, applets and plugins are dead. They don't work everywhere. You have to debug them everywhere, not write them everywhere. So then this happens. Any Java people? Where are my Java people at? Java people don't like this. <laughs> yeah, she's like, she's like, no, don't say that about Java. Java script and Java are not related. They only called it that because it's fun to say Java. <laughs> right? That's the only reason. That's, not, that's a lie. Don't do that. Now, JavaScript, though, is going to make things better, right? It's going to power the internet. Now, as we're all code newbies here at CodeLand, we know what it's like to learn JavaScript. I made a flow chart of what it's like to learn <laughs> and to work in JavaScript on a regular basis. Right? What? <laughs> JavaScript. <laughs> but you can do amazing stuff in JavaScript right now. People are doing. Emulators. This is a complete emulator of a Commodore 64. Isn't that beautiful? My, first, my dad sold his van and walked to work to buy me a C64 to keep me off the street. And I'm not joking. Yeah. Now, to be clear, I was on the street doing fake IDs. And I was more likely to be convicted of a white collar crime that involved fake IDs. Uh, but as far as what a dot matrix printer could do, my IDs were sharp. <laughs> I may or may not be a year older than I think I am. So that's another conversation. But yes, my first computer was a Commodore 64, and my dad sold the car to get it. What can you do in JavaScript? Well, you can do crazy stuff. You can do amazing stuff. You know what you can do with JavaScript? You can do this. I love old computers. I like seeing old computers. But I also want to do virtual reality. I'm trying to figure out how can we balance that. So I found this thing online where someone could go and do virtual reality in the browser. So you can actually boot up a copy of Windows in a virtual machine. But that's not, that's not all. Why don't we do that in a virtual reality room so I can actually go back to my, I can go back to my mom's basement and then live in the basement and then I can actually open up, this is, this is real, I'm gonna open up Solitaire. And, right? Because that's, that's JavaScript, right? That's JavaScript making it, making it happen, bringing it every day, JavaScript. So then what happens is your boss says, well, does the site work without JavaScript? No. That's a stupid question. <laughs> you can't disable JavaScript. You will probably die. Well, does it work without cookies? Man, get out of my face. People can make games in JavaScript that are beautiful. They can run Quake and Doom. If you're a C++ person or a games person, did you know that you can compile C++ to JavaScript? Isn't that amazing? Yes, she's nodding her head because she's like, yes, and it's the most beautiful thing ever. Yeah, something is coming soon that's going to make that even better for you. And if you think I have a demo, no. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. But I will remind you of the demo a second ago that was really amazing, so you can just feel good twice. All right. Um, remember this, though. This diagram is the characteristics that make something an operating system. What if we take the characteristics of JavaScript and overlay them? It turns out JavaScript could be considered an operating system. That's really interesting, because did you know that, uh, that Atwood's law is that any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript? <laughs> That's true. This is going to allow us to write really anything. Uh, unfortunately, Atwood does not realize that any application that could be written in Microsoft Excel will eventually be written in Microsoft Excel. The New York Library talk was amazing. She did not tell you the whole thing was run in Excel. It's all based on Excel, isn't it, right? Just like that time Kelly Rowland texted Nelly from Excel. <laughs> Do y'all remember that? <laughs> like, I guess you just, you just text an A1, and then they bring it back to you in like B2. Is that what's up with that? Oh, she forgot. He never, he never texted back. She forgot to, forgot to put equal sign. <laughs> I do that, too. I do that, too. I think, I think uh, actually, it was probably Farah that was using Excel. That's why she's not around anymore. Um, 
So we've got another operating system, though, on our phones, don't we? We have two operating systems. You have Android. I have iPhone. We both have JavaScript. We can make applications around JavaScript. Now, some people don't think that's a good idea. This young man said back in the day that he felt that HTML5 was not a good bet. It was too soon. Right? People are saying maybe it was too soon. But then now they're doing React. So they caught up and they realized the web is happening. There's an avalanche coming down. The, basically, this, uh, this giant snowball is coming down. The avalanche has begun. It's too late for the pebbles to vote. If you bet on the web, if you learn web technologies, you will be successful. Now, when we say JavaScript or we say HTML5, it's really a family, right? It's JavaScript and all of its greatness. It's HTML5, it's CSS3, and it's confusing. Sometimes people will just say HTML5, right? And then they don't know if their browser will support that. So it's hard to tell. How do you tell HTML from HTML5? Well, it's very simple. You try it out in Internet Explorer. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, it's HTML5. <laughs> that makes sense? I hope that I've cleared that up for everybody, because it's really hard to be a web designer at this time. <laughs> now, that guy's got no butt. Um, back in the day, back in the day, HTML tables were the most advanced thing that computers had. Now, we saw the CTO, former CTO of New York talk about AI. AI and HTML table. I, I majored in HTML tables at a liberal arts school. And I know that, that the number, the maximum number of nested tables you can have is 32. And the only way you know that is by staring that 33rd table in the face. <laughs> Satan himself comes out of the screen and tells you that was a bad idea. <laughs> so when I learned how to do tables, I immediately got a job. And then I learned how to do row span, and then I was promoted. <laughs> Right, I'm breaking. Hey, <laughs> so now I'm like, hey, I can do anything in tables. I'm making tables. I got one pixel animated gifs, little inv invisible gifs and stuff. And then people trying to teach me new technology. I don't know HTML5. I don't know CSS. I guess I'll just go to my favorite websites and I'll go right click view source, and then I go there and it's just a div. <laughs> like, well, how in the hell <laughs> does Gmail work if it's just one div? Is the div Gmail? I don't know. Well, HTML is just the structure, right? CSS is the color and the style. Where are my CSS people at? CSS is this beautiful, expressive language that gives you exactly what you want every time. You know, you feel in your soul what you want to get from CSS, and it happens for you. It's so powerful. It's so expressive. In fact, I worked with Saran to get you all special CSS mugs. We produced them, and uh, <laughs> I was going to give everybody a mug. But I don't know CSS yet, and I'm having some struggles. So I went and I found a, a code newbie here who would hook me up to fix this mug. And I'm not really feeling <laughs> that, that that solution is exactly what we need. So the mugs may be delivered later, or they may, come, they may never come. So JavaScript then is the glue that plugs those things together. And I just happen to have one of my early home videos of me learning JavaScript, very first time writing some JavaScript. Little Scott. <laughs> JavaScript is so great that you don't even need to learn the bad parts. <laughs> just learn the good parts. Uh, one book I do recommend, though, is called Secrets of a JavaScript Ninja, made by John Resig, who made jQuery. It's an amazing book. It's worth buying. Definitely check it out. But I mentioned, when I saw the cover, I said, that is a samurai. <laughs> so I said, why is a samurai on the cover of JavaScript Ninja? And he said, JavaScript is loosely typed. It was, it was a duck typing joke. It was a duck typing joke. Sorry. I apologize. Whew. I apologize. Now, speaking of fake quotes, somebody said that JavaScript is becoming the assembly language of the web. Who said that? Me. I said that. Well, everybody else said that because it's true. I said that a while back. I wrote a whole blog post about eight years ago about this, and it got on Reddit, and they were all kind of mean to me. And they were like, that's a stupid thing to say. How stupid are you? You're stupid. Just kind of like that. And, 
so I needed to call the people who invented JavaScript to see if that's really a statement that's true. So I called a guy named Brendan Eich. You know what Brendan Eich is? He invented JavaScript in a week. And you, Brendan Eich, people are nodding their heads. So I called Brendan Eich. And I said, <laughs> I said, Brendan. Now that is, uh, hang on, that is Brendan Fraser. <laughs> yeah, he was in The Mummy. Uh, that is Brendan Eich. But, uh, well, Brendan Fraser's a beautiful man. So let's give Brendan Fraser, <laughs> let's give Brendan Fraser a little time. He said that, he said that uh, JavaScript is the x86 of the web. That's like assembly language of the web a couple years ago, but he can't claim it's original because it's kind of an obvious statement. It's become that language that you use. Now, I said this eight years ago not knowing anything about what I was talking about. But then it happened. Web assembly is happening, and now it's going to be a binary form of JavaScript where you can take languages you know, your C++s and your Javas and your C Sharps, and compile them into something that will run directly in the browser. And it's actually a joint effort. So everybody's doing this. It's going to work in Google. It's going to be Mozilla. Everyone's moving this forward. It's happening. You got to be careful, though, when you're becoming a developer. You don't want to let layers hide too much complexity. jQuery is great, but you got to go underneath. My dad did not let me drive an automatic car. This is a big thing that happened in the 80s. It's like, well, you know, somebody's going to break their leg, and if you don't know how to drive a manual, then the dude's going to bleed out, and it's going to be your <laughs> fault because you can't double clutch. <laughs> so he made me learn that way, right? I couldn't get a digital watch until I had an analog watch. That's why I don't have a digital watch. Got to learn those kind of things. So uh, don't let layers hide complexity, because if you start to get slick, with one of these tools. You're like, hey, man, check me out. I got my jQuery. I'm feeling it. jQuery, <laughs> right? I'm going to do that one again. We probably should have turned these lights off. It'd be less dim. <laughs> you got to know what's happening underneath. jQuery is an amazing tool. It's a layer of abstraction that hides complexity, though. And you want to be the one that can go underneath and say, wow, there's WebSockets. And oh, that was a callback. And oh, I did a DOM event there and figure that stuff out. Now, people have been saying in interviews, though, well, no one writes JavaScript anymore, right? They write jQuery. That's cool. You know who said that quote? jQuery. <laughs> jQuery uh, has done, this is, uh, this is, if you go to Google and you go look for jQuery on Wikipedia, it says jQuery. This article is about the actor for the JavaScript library, see jQuery. <laughs> this is jQuery's Twitter headshot. So I just decided jQuery said that. The great thing about jQuery is that once you know about jQuery, you won't use jQuery for the times you need jQuery. Because you're going to go back to your boss, and your boss is going to be like, should we use jQuery on this project? And you're going to have to call his agent, see if he's available for work. <laughs> you're going to be checking his IMDB page. You don't know what J you know, jQuery was in Fred 2, Night of Living Fred. He's been doing some work, but it's not JavaScript work. But you have this image in your mind about how you want to make your application. You visualize, it's going to be amazing. I'm going to build it, and then I build it, and it's not quite the same. And then I don't know who to blame, whose fault that is, and I feel really sad. I'm like, I don't really know what happened. Try using vanilla JS. You all know about the vanilla JS library? It's this amazing, amazing JavaScript library we're going to go and check out. I'm going to go and say vanilla js.com. Uh -uh. This is fast, lightweight, cross-platform library. What you can do is you go and click here and you say, I want Ajax, I want a math library, I want strings. And it's going to build you a library that you can download. Now, it's a little bigger when you zip it. <laughs> now, when you do it in development, you just put in the script path. But when it comes time to go to production, you just delete that line. Because <laughs> vanilla JavaScript is vanilla JavaScript. You have all of that stuff right now, and it costs you exactly nothing. I just want to remind you, I apologize for trolling everybody for that. <laughs> but you have all those things already. Now, that doesn't mean jQuery doesn't have value. It has immense value. But you need to know what it does so that you can take advantage of that. You're going to want to expect more from your web tools. You've got powerful, powerful machines that all work together now. And they're working together in a way that they never did before. Before, we were doing browser sniffing and looking at user agents. I mean, yeah, shaking your head. Just like, so rip that page out of your resume, just like I did, and get to know some of the new modern things that are happening, things that we learned about today, and things that we're going to learn about tomorrow at some of the amazing workshops that are lined up. And what I said to the woman at Intel, and what I want to say to you all here, 
is the cloud gives you this massive scale and whatever language makes you happy, you can be successful in. Don't let anybody hate on your language. If you use PHP, then use PHP and be proud about it. If you use Erlang, I don't know that language, but good luck. Um, <laughs> do your thing. And remember though, that the browser is deceptively powerful because the browser has a virtual machine too. Maybe you scale up your cloud to 10 virtual machines. Remember that the thousand users that hit your site have a thousand virtual machines. And you have a pocket supercomputer with a lot of work. So if you have a site that is uh, generating dynamically a PNG of a graphic to show people a chart, maybe D3JS or some JavaScript or some client side thing would be more appropriate and give them a better experience. Depends on the customer, depends on their devices, depends on the experience. You need to scale that appropriately. But just don't forget that there was a time where we went out and bought 3D graphics cards, and now a $200 computer from Walmart has advanced 3D graphics. So you have unlimited virtual machines. You can write in any language, and you have a powerful VM, a virtual machine, on the browser. You can write JavaScript or target it by compiling to JavaScript. So put those machines to work, and I want to tell you, you already know the cloud. You've at the right conference, at the right time to know this stuff, and you can program the browser so you're powerful. You are powerful. And we appreciate you. We appreciate you for coming here. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let's give another round of applause for Scott Hanselman. Oh my god. That was awesome. Thanks, man.